What I've loved about being a mom, it's made me exponentially a better human being, and it's made me unquestionably a better artist. Hi, I'm Cynthia Cortman Westfall, a Broadway music director, voice coach, and tenured professor in the musical theater department at the University of Michigan. And I'm Chelsea Wilson, a performer turned voice teacher to Broadway stars and vocal coach on Broadway productions like The Phantom of the Opera, School of Rock, and more. Here on the Broadway Vocal Coach Podcast, you can expect real talk about the business, practical advice, and constant encouragement. We believe there's space for every artist in this industry. All you need is the right support. So consider us your two-woman hype team. Welcome to the Broadway Vocal Coach Podcast, where we help musical theater performers get unstuck and take the next step in their careers. Hi, everybody. Today, we are welcoming Erin Dilly to the podcast. Welcome, (laughs) Erin Dilly. Hi, everybody. Aaron, nice Aaron and I did a little Broadway show called A Christmas Story, which is now what ten years ago? Yeah, is it's about ten years. Um, it's about ten years. I just got my little sort of reminder on all the social media yes. outlets. So we worked closely on that show together. Became great friends. Did Madison Square Garden the year after that. Got to teach together this past summer, and we have kids the same age, and so we just became fast friends, and I adore all things Erin Dilly. I can't wait for all of you to get to know her through this next hour. (laughs) Yeah, let me share with you a little bit about our fantastic guest today, Erin Dilly. Erin is a Tony-nominated Broadway, TV, and film veteran with over 25 years in the industry. Broadway leading roles include A Christmas Story, Nice Work If You Can Get It, opposite Mr. Matthew Broderick, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, for which she was nominated for a Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical, Into the Woods, Boys from Syracuse, Fiorello, and Babes in Arms. Most recently, she stood by for Sarah Jessica Parker for the lead role in Plaza Suite, opening at the Colonial Theater in Boston, then moving on to a sold-out run on Broadway at the historic Hudson Theater. She starred in the national tours of South Pacific, Martin Gare, and Beauty and the Beast. She's worked extensively on TV and film, including Boardwalk Empire, Bull, Blue Bloods, Person of Interest, Elementary, The Good Wife, Law and Order, Gossip Girl, Too Big to Fail, and Julie and Julia, among others. She's worked extensively in the regions, among them being the Muni, Goodspeed Opera House, the Guthrie, Paper Mill Playhouse, and the Alley Theater. She's adjunct faculty at Pace University and Manhattan School of Music in their musical theater departments, and she's the founder of her own studio, The Living Studio, in New York City. Erin is co-founder of the performing arts intensive 12 Miles to Broadway, as well as establishing the flourishing Broadway training camp, Five Days of Broadway, at the Segerstrom Center for the Arts in Costa Mesa, California. She's also been a guest instructor with Kristen Chenoweth's Broadway Boot Camp. She resides in Glen Ridge, New Jersey, with her husband, Broadway veteran and teacher, Stephen Buntruck, and their two children, Anna Lou and Katie. Welcome, Erin. What a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much. And my daughter, my 17-year-old daughter, who just was like literally days ago, was accepted to her dream college, Lehigh University. So it's a very, very exciting time here at the Bunch Rock House. Wow. I know. Congratulations. It's really, really cool. I was not at all prepared. And there's the other member of the Bunch Rock House, and his name is Samuel. And he is a very, very opinionated small scrappy creature he's very very vocal and we're gonna hope that he shuts that down <laughs> he's gonna be fine but he he's might not oh, Lord. he just he just um, adds to the experience he does he does but yeah my daughter just was accepted to college and I kind of wondered where you were in that process of acceptances Miss Cynthia Miss Cynthia BFF Cynthia is what it says in my telephone because when I met her 10 years ago I was like we are best friends you just don't know it yet and we're going to <laughs> yeah. be from henceforth and whenever I see you, is we just pick up where we left off, which I'm so, gr- which I am tremendously grateful for. I know, same, same. So where we are at right now is applications are in. He applied to six schools, I believe. He's been accepted to five, which is fantastic. oh come on, way to go! Uh, dream school. We are still waiting on. We have not heard yet. From the dream school, but you know, it's nice to have some options. 
have you had measured responses? Have you been mm -hmm, way to go? We're very proud. Or you were you like I was where I had like well, projectile, ugly cry tears pop out of my face. <laughs> I don't, know I was not I, prepared for that. I'm never terribly measured to be honest. You know, I I'm <laughs> <laughs> relatively excited. I'm, I'm the one who's like, Oh, gosh, this is and the three boys in my family are like, good job, bro. Put it together. Where to go, bro. Bruh. Yeah. Bruh. Bruh. <laughs> B-R-U-H. Bruh. B-R-U-H. So I've been very excited. The other reactions have been a little more subdued. <laughs> but I have <laughs> no. enough enthusiasm for the entire family. It's fine. <laughs> That's the role I play in my family as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I am going to be very interested, by the way. I know we're going to be talking about family and motherhood and having a family in this industry. I think it should be a round table discussion, mothers. I want to hear mm. about everything that you think and have learned in your journeys thus far. Mm. I mean, you know, there's Sounds me, good. sure. But I'm very interested in the two of you as well. Oh, I well, have so when you start a podcast, you. you can have us on as guests, Erin <laughs> Dilly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn the tables. Just wait and see. Just well, wait we're going to start with you. Because our okay. podcast listeners hear from us a lot. Uh -huh. We don't get to hear from Erin Dilly a lot. So we're going to start with you. You've got two teenagers. You've got a husband who's also a working actor. You had a Broadway show on the boards last season. You also teach. What else is going on in life right now? What are you working on? Are you actively working on auditioning? Do you continue to look for commercial work, television work, film work? Like, where are you at kind of in your phase of life right now? The nice thing that's, that's sort of happened with my career is that it, blessedly, work begets work for me at this moment. So that it allows me to focus on what has become actually my deepest passion, which is teaching. In the last 10 years, I'd say I've been adjunct at ACE for about nine years, and I've been at MSM for six, and teaching in various capacities all over the country in different intensives and programs that I've been creating. And, you know, when opportunities come up, certainly, I'm like, well, sure, I'd like to do that. I'll stand by for Sarah Jessica and work with one of my best friends, Mike McGraw, who very, very sadly we lost recently. It kind of allows me to to not need to be as aggressive in the industry as I think I once was. But what it does do is that when I step back into, like when I worked on the show for it, it ended up being all told about two years well, interrupted briefly by a pandemic, because mm -hmm. we actually, we started Plaza Suite two and a half months in 2019, going into 2020. And our invited dress was March 8th on Broadway, 2020. Oh my gosh. And we wow. got the call and we got the call from the Broadway League that everybody should just go home and just take a breath. And we weren't quite sure what was going to happen, but just stay put. They put for two years. Yeah. <laughs> it's wow. what, it, what it turned out to be. Wow. It was completely surreal. And well, what we all lived through was completely harrowing and surreal. But the fact that the entire company came back together was also celebratory and magnificent mm -hmm. and one of the greatest experiences of my life. But to be able to go back, work on a play that I loved as much with a company that I really respected that much put into practice all of the things that I'm teaching in the classroom and flex the muscles and figure out sort of all this language that I'm using with students and go, oh, that's what I've been talking about. Oh, that's what I'm, I'm actually pontificating and going on about. The two kind of feed each other in a beautiful way. But honestly, more and more, what feeds me the most is the classroom, is giving back. I can start to see that that is my role. My role is to be guiding the next generation. If somebody says, Erin Dilly, you need to play this role. This is a role that is meant for you. Come and play this part. I'm not going to say absolutely not. <laughs> but I don't, I don't feel an insatiable need to go and pound a pavement. Yeah. I, I do feel that need to be a part of the next generation. What I want to do is I want to help empower. I want that courage back in the room mm -hmm. between yeah. generationally. 
I want it back in the room because I feel like we have a lot to learn from one another. Yeah. Yep. I agree. You mentioned how, you know, you don't feel that insatiable need anymore to do that hustle. I know back when I was in my 20s, I hustled like no oh, one hustled and, and it's it was insatiable. All I did. That is what I went. Were you the same? Did you back in the all young did. days, did you feel that way? That's all I did. It's all I did. I, and I, it's funny because I'm, I'm teaching at two major institutions and I don't think I'd be able to do it now if I was 22, <laughs> but I couldn't wait. I just couldn't. I was so excited. Yep. I was like, I've got hit me with a hot note, 16 bar, and I've got till there was you, 16 bar. Thank you, Brett. Black. <laughs> and I booked so many jobs. And with them. look where it got you. I mean, because I was unquestionably myself. I didn't bring anybody else in the room but me. So perhaps everybody else was singing them, but I was me. Mm. And it never occurred to me to slow down. It never occurred to me. It was something I was thinking about. I was, I was they always want kids. I, I grew up, I have the most amazing mother in the world. We might all say that. But my mom is my favorite person and my best friend still. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have kids. I'm going to be like my mom. I'm going to have kids my entire life. But my mother was also a powerhouse professional. She was an educator and a badass administrator. She was regularly getting degrees as we were growing up. She got her master's and then she got her specialist and then she got her PhD. Like all the while we were in high school, she was off getting degrees. She, and then she ended up in her, her final position was as superintendent of schools. Wow. I mean, yeah, she was Gosh, for that generation. Cause you and I are about the same age for that generation yeah. that our mothers were, I mean, it's... my mother still had to get permission from my father to open a checking account. I mean, that is exactly, story, you know, <laughs> exactly. That was, and my mom didn't get to go to college and never was able to get degrees. You know, it just wasn't in the cards for her in that generation. So that's, I think a, a little bit unusual for a woman of that it's generation, which is, it's really impressive. Really cool and model I, for you. And I think a lot of my drive came from her, but as did the fact that while that professional modeling was happening my entire life, it was also the fact that it was unquestionable that we were her first priority, that I would call my mother at any time of the day from college, from Ann Arbor, because I went to Michigan, and she'd pick up the phone any time of the day I'd call her. She'd pick up the phone, and I'd say, hi, Mama. I'm just randomly, like in the middle of class, and I'd say, where am I catching you? She's like, I'm in a board meeting. I'm like, mom, don't pick up the phone. I mean, she's like, it's okay. It's you. She's a superintendent in a board meeting. And she's like, but it's you, honey. I'm like, mama, put the phone down. You, It's it's okay. I'll call you later. Are you okay? I'm fine, mom. I'm going to Stucci's. I'm getting some ice cream. I'm fine. I'm going to share a little conversation I had with a former student. We were both working on a national tour at the time. And she happened to be a former student who happened to be in the show that I was working on. And we were actually, we would drive in together to the show each night. And one night she came out of the theater crying, just sobbing. And I, you know, what is wrong? What happened? And she'd had a conversation with someone else in the show. And apparently she had said something about how someday she really wanted to have kids and be a working actor and have kids. And the other person in the show said, one or the other, you can't do both. And she was like, well, no, but I see other people doing both. And she's like, they're not really, not really. No, but either you're going to be a crummy mom or you're going to lose jobs and you're not going to end up working. You can only do one or the other. And she really mm. took that to heart and was just sobbing on the way out. Wow. So I love that you had the role model of the mother who was badass at work and an amazing mom. Did that help you feel? Because I do feel like the generation you and I came up in. I didn't think I would have kids for the longest time. I didn't want kids for the longest time. I was so driven in my career and it didn't occur to me that I could be successful in both areas. Did you feel like seeing your mom, was it ever a question for you or did you just assume I can do both and I'm going to be fabulous at both? I always knew I was going to do both. Wow. I always knew I was going to do I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to put my dog outside. I'll be right back <laughs> because that's what working moms have to do. That's what they do. Samuel, outside. Oh, Sam, it's 
monsooning. Oh, gosh, oh no. Please Poor keep guy. this in the podcast. Please keep this in the <laughs> I think we are going to have to. No, what's interesting is I always knew that I was going to have both. And I was a little alarmed, actually, that I didn't have that desire for kids. I thought I was going to be like Mother Earth. I want, I can't wait to have my children. I was just like eye on the prize of career for so long that I thought, uh oh. Maybe, maybe it's just that dr- drum beat. It's not going to happen for me, that womb beat. But it actually did happen. And it was very seismic in my life. My The grandmother that I was really closest to in my life passed away in my early 30s. And I had, Stephen and I were married or early on in our marriage. And it's like I felt the earth shift a little bit. And mm-hmm. I generationally, it was like suddenly my mom was sort of on deck. Cause I was like, my grandmother passed away and I was like, well, now you're the grandma. And I remember looking at Steve and I was like, we have to have a baby now. We're having a baby. <laughs> and he was like, okay. All right. <laughs> and for me, it was very clear. I don't know. Did you, ha- did either of you have a moment that was clear for you about children? Did you go, no. this is very we didn't. Murky, okay. No, in fact, I told my husband back when we were dating, I said, I don't think I want kids. And let okay. me know now if that's a deal breaker for you. And at the time, he was like, okay, okay. You know, I haven't thought about it extensively, but okay. And then a few months later, he came back to me and was like, I think it is a deal breaker. And I was like, sit. We were sat on this. So then I'm like, well, now I have to go think about it. You know, and then at the end of the day, I decided that. I didn't want to lose Kirk. So I said, I'll have one. That's what I agreed to. <laughs> Where's the paper? And then what the second one was a bit of a surprise. And of course, I can't imagine not having the second one. But no, it was a little murky for me. I was, okay. I was so driven by the career. And like I said, I didn't see growing up as many women really having a big career and a family and balancing it well. I didn't have a lot of that and yeah. none of my friends in New York had that either. So it, I didn't have a lot to look to to think, oh, that's what I want to do. And it's possible. Mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, it was a little yeah. lucky for me. But at the minute I had them, then it's like the close in shot. You know, it's like then it becomes really clear. And of course, that's what you were meant to do. And of course, it needed to play out that way. But Chelsea, how what about do you, you think, Chelsea? You're, you're in it right now. Uh, I am <laughs> ready to blow I'm any minute. Three weeks from bearing a child. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you might be one day Maybe. from bearing a I child. Might. I might. Oh, don't say that, Cynthia. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> uh, it could be today. Oh, I know. I, mean, I know. It's freaking did you me have? Out. Did you have a reckoning? Did you have like a, a little beat, a womb beat? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I feel like my path to motherhood was surprising surprising and usual my husband and I we got married during the pandemic we eloped in my parents backyard it's a great story you know so the beginning of our marriage was pandemic and I had a lot of upheaval in my life at that time I'd left the city all my work was online so I left the city and we we were living in Milwaukee which is where he was living and then soon we moved to Washington State for his residency program still like pandemic times is 2021 and i don't know having kids was something i always wanted always wanted and for a while thought maybe it wouldn't happen for me just not having the right relationship not being with the right person and when jordan and i got together and we had just like the craziest of circumstances of the start of our marriage It was like, oh, well, let's get the ball rolling. That's kind of how I felt. It was kind of like, well, everything's lining up. And I don't know, I'm living in places I've never lived before, never thought this is what my life and my career would look like, but let's get it started, you know? So we had our first daughter in the fall of 2021 and we're weeks slash hours away from expecting our second. So who knows? (laughs) Keep you posted. (laughs) Well, see, there's three different examples, three working women. Yeah. who had a, three different experiences with that sort of reckoning mm-hmm. of how it landed in them, do you know, mm-hmm. if we wanted them, and then how it manifested actually in, in the... Once you had your babies, <laughs> your beautiful little girls, 
Did that shift anything in your career or your priorities? Did the eight show a week, week after week? Did that change things for you? What happened after the yeah, baby shifted. Came? It shifted everything. In an interesting way, it opened up my television career because I didn't want to do eight shows a week. I didn't want to be away for those kind of hours. I knew that if I worked on television, it would be episodic. I'd be away for long hours, but just for eight days. So for much of their childhood, I just did episodic television, which was wonderful, which is a bit of a hustle, but I was still sort of in good hustling mode. And I made a lot of money and I figured out how to work in a different medium that I actually found I'm very well suited for. And I love because it was always actually my first, my first love has always been acting even before mm -hmm. singing, even before being on stage and, and, and living in that sort of largesse. I enjoy small, intimate, vulnerable spaces, but it also just changed why I went to work in the best way. It didn't matter as much. As in, I didn't care what people thought of my work as much because I, I was working to pay my mortgage. And because I didn't care as much, my work was better. My humanity busted wide open because of what I was pouring into my life's work, which was these creatures who were sucking the life force out of me. I mean, on <laughs> one hand, but they were also making me infinitely more interesting infinitely more vulnerable. For the longest time I was booking things where like, were mothers, I was mother everything and every sad episodic television, you just like look at my IMDB where I'm a mother who cries on cue. And I somebody asked me on once, they're like, how do you do that? And I was like, I have toddlers. I have toddlers. That's how I do it. I don't sleep a lot. And I have Others. And at the time I was like, Anna was three and a half and Katie was a baby. Yeah. So I was just like in it, just in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is catharsis. Like work was easy and go to work and <laughs> yeah. you know, it's work is hurry up and wait. They'd be like, we're not going to be ready for like two hours. I was like, that's wonderful. Oh, dang it out. <laughs> just dang it out. <laughs> Yep. Yep. I love yep. That. So yes. it changed. It changed. And so when I finally kind of came back to it and I did nice work and I did Christmas story and I, it, they were a little bit bigger. They were not much, but they were, you know, six, seven, getting a little bit bigger. I think Christmas story, our kids were four and six. Mine were four and six. So yours must have been three like, and six. Exactly. Four and six? Yeah. 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 We're, look how I think they were a little bit bigger. Didn't we? But big, you know, I remember a lot of rehearsals I played for A Christmas Story. I took the boys along with me and I set them up with coloring books next to the piano, yep. which is different. You know, they were just old enough that I could bring them into the theater and mostly rely on the fact that they would stay occupied in the next four hours if I brought in enough snacks and activities and they to do. Came, <laughs> of course they came with you to New York. That's what I'm yeah. thinking. Yeah, they were there. The whole were, time. You, were you teaching? Were you at Michigan? Already? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I took a leave of absence. And yep. they came. Yep. And so your six-year-old was in first grade? Yeah, that would have been first grade. Yep. I just know I pulled them out of no. school. And I remember one of the, the first time I pulled them out of school, the teacher was very not happy. This is going <gasps> to set him back. He is I not know. Gonna stay on track. This is going to set him back so far. If you pull him out for four months, I really fear for his future. I have pulled this kid out of school so many times at this point <laughs> for up to Why a year we... at a time. Yep. There was a time when Stephen and I went to Los Angeles for the proverbial. This is when there was a pilot season, when this still existed. So pilot season now really is kind of year round. But there was a pilot season in L.A. when Anna was in pre-K. And I remember I came and had the conversation with her pre-K teacher, I said, we're just going to, we're going to go to LA. It's pilot season. It's just a sort of a rite of passage thing that actors have to do. She said, you're taking Anna with you? I said, well, I mean, I have to. She's, she's five and I'm going to we're gonna take the baby. The baby's two and a half and we're just going to go. And, and she sent a whole packet of things with Anna to do. It was a pre-K baby. 
It was a baby. She was in pre-K. Yeah. I mean, and I now all that said, I love this teacher. This is a wonderful woman. Oh, we did too. They were yeah, we did too. Totally concerned about. By the way, they had a ball. Anna to this yeah. day is like, I am a California girl. She's like, I recommend everybody spend <laughs> yeah. a pre-K abroad, like yeah. at, on the Santa Monica Pier. Yeah. If like, anything, I think nice. it has just added so much to who they are because they've been pulled out so many times and lived in so many different of places. Course. But and I'm also they come that with was you my, on tour. They they did for for an entire year. Yeah. With come from away. Oh. With come from away. Yeah. Which was when they were I pulled them out of school fifth grade. Harry missed fifth grade completely, and August missed seventh grade completely. <laughs> See, everybody, come on, let's be honest. Everyone should miss seventh grade. Well, That's yeah, awesome. We can I mean, we did. It, I think we did bypass a lot of the drama, to be honest. But here's what I learned. I know you did, this, Aaron. And I wonder if you feel the same, because our lives are a little different than a nine to five job. They're different. Yeah. You never know where you're going to be. Your boss is different. Every time you take a new job, it's a different boss. It's a different set of colleagues. It's often a different location. You know, you have to learn a whole new skill set. It feels like every time you get a new job between the times when either teachers said that this is going to be really detrimental and they're going to be set back. Or I had a number of people I, I asked advice for about come from away of whether I should take them along on tour. And pretty much nobody said yes. They all thought that would be a big mistake. And what I finally have realized is not to ask advice of people who aren't sort of living the life that I want to live. Like the life that I want to live is I want to have my career, which means a lot of things at this point. I still work professionally, but I also teach, obviously, and I have an online community and I love all of it. I want to do all of it. I also want to be a really present mother. I also want to be in a marriage where we are together most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask advice of people who see that vision. <laughs> yeah. Understood. And if, and if you Understood. aren't on that same path of, of believing that there's a way to have that, then you aren't the right person to ask advice of. <laughs> Which I on think it's so person, insightful asking advice of what I want to hear. But I do believe like with moms in this business, you have to think outside the box a little bit because yeah, I do. do think there's you a way to do. have it, quote unquote, all like you might not be able to give everything 100 percent. Things are going to be tricky. But yeah, no, we were my kids were the Von Buntrocks. We were like <laughs> for many, many summers we planned, especially when they were little. We planned before they got attached to their pals here and like what their plans were going to be. We'd take jobs at the Cape Cod Playhouse specifically. We were yeah. like, because we want to be near a beach because we're like, right. let's let's play for three weeks at the beach with the kids. Or we, we did a play together at the Berkshire Theater Festival because we're like, let's go to the Berkshires with the kids for a summer. And we would just literally put them in the trunk and take them with us. There was a great summer. We did Meet Me in St. Louis. Stephen and I started the show and the kids were in the show. Oh, Mike said, that. the kids the kids can be in the show. There's no reason that they can't be two of the Muni kids. And it was thrilling. It was sort of right in the time when Anna was interested in theater. So Aaron. Oh my goodness. Yes, love. What, what advice would you have for actors who want to, quote unquote, have it all? I, I really do want to hear from both of you because I'm just, a, I'm a little behind y'all. I'm, I'm coming up, but I'm a little behind y'all. Yes. What is your advice for people who want to have it all? But when we're honest about it too, like what does get lost? What do you have to sacrifice or say no to or choose differently? Because, oh, I mean, I'm so in that right now. And I only know yeah. it just continues and it continues to evolve. So I don't know. What, what, what do you think, Erin? Well, my thought is always to, to stay in constant sort of contact with the idea of balance, first and foremost, because knowing that I've got two kids and I've got a wonderful, like, even as you were talking about all of the things in your life, Cynthia, and I thought, yes, every single one of those you need and deserve and should have. And in the middle of that should be my BFF Cynthia and a radiant amount of like self-care balance mm. because 
and the pursuit of wanting it all, right? And especially women, we think we have to do everything, take care of everyone, be the greatest at what we do, be the most pr proficient performer, be the most amazing parent, be the most incredible spouse, be the most, instead of just keeping track of every single day waking up, what is it that I want to do today? How can I be of service to myself, to my family, to my neighbor, my dog? How can I stay in balance? I think the idea of the pursuit of having it all makes me, like even hearing that makes me feel in balance. <laughs> because I've never, even though I have a career and I have kids and I have a loud dog and I have multiple jobs as you do BFF Cynthia and lots of things, lots of balls in the air all the time. I always are, am kind of working on deperfecting all of it. Like I'm not doing it all terrifically. I'm just doing the best I can. Yep. I'm making the best effort I can. And that's why you know, always it's always in quotes. Do it all is always in quotes for me. Yeah. Because you can't do everything at 100% all the time. Mm -mm. You absolutely can't. totally can. okay. Nor do you need to, to be honest. <laughs> no. But understanding that the aspiration, the wanting of, hey, I want kids. I want a big, beautiful life and a big career and a lot of things and i want an online community and i want to and i want to be a conductor on broadway and i want a television show that i'm starring in and i want that aspiration hell yes mm -hmm. want all of it and then wake up every morning take a deep breath meditate see where you are that day and see where that day takes you as opposed to like failing because it's not every single one of those things is in place yet yeah. I also remember at one point when the kids were fairly little, it finally dawned. On, I don't know if you had this moment, Aaron, but it finally dawned on me that when I was at work, I felt so guilty that I wasn't with my kids. And when I was mm -hmm. with my kids, I was sitting there running down the list of all the things I should be doing at work and all the things that I wanted to do. And, and so I was constantly trying to wear both hats at the same time. And when I mm -hmm. finally got clear on that... It was exponentially better when I started going to work and knowing that, listen, I'm at work right now. I can't be with my kids at this moment. So I might as well go 100% towards work right now. Let's make this work day the best work day and let's let go of the guilt. They're in good hands. I made sure they're taken care of well. They're with their dad for crying out loud or, you know. Totally. Uh, Agreed. And then when I was with my kids, I had to do the same thing that, you know what, you can't work right now anyway. So stop thinking about it. Put the kid hat on. Stop trying to wear both hats at the same time. Mm -hmm. Put one hat yep. on at a time. And that helped mm -hmm. me a lot. The yep, other I thing that, that helped me a lot was, I don't know where I got this, but it was this like 10, 10, 10 rule of will it matter in 10 minutes? Will it matter in 10 weeks? And will it matter in 10 years? And that changed my life because there were a handful of things with the kids that I thought, you know what? They're going to remember this in 10 years. They're going to remember that I didn't show up for that. If I don't go to this oh, that's event, really they're going to remember in 10 years. And so I'm going to say no to this work thing because that's something they're going to remember. There were other times where it was the opposite. Like Christmas Story was one of them that when I took that job, I knew it had the potential for really cool travel with the family. I knew it had the potential for, because it was seasonal, for being years of work, which it did. It ended up being yes. four years of my life. Tons of travel with the kids. It was a family-friendly show. It was life-changing to do that show. So that was another one where it was like, I think this is going to be a big one that is going to be, I want to take this job because it's going to have a high impact in all kinds of good ways. There were other things yeah. that I'm like, my kids aren't going to remember that I didn't bring muffins to the bake off thing at the preschool. Such a good perspective. I'm going to let that one go. So yeah. 10, 10, 10, like, is this going to matter? You know, and the 10 weeks Oops, one, that's fantastic. It's like, is this going to make your life harder in 10 weeks or is it going to make your life easier in 10 weeks? Or mm -hmm. is it, are we going to, so that's how the week one works for me. But 
that one still I use to this day is, oh, is this gonna love matter? It. Is someone going to care about this in 10 years, including myself? Will I care about it in 10 years? Will my kids care about it in 10 years? Will Kurt oh, I care love about that. It? Yeah. Love that. I'm also curious <laughs> too, because, you know, all three of us have spouses. How do you feel like this conversation relates to marriage as well? Let's just take a quick pivot. You know, like, Pivoting. <laughs> because, Pivoting. Pivot. You, you know, in, in your case, Aaron, your husband's in the same field as you. For me and Cynthia, that's not necessarily the case. But how do you maintain that relationship as well? I mean, that's part of this whole parenthood conversation. You know, you and your spouse became parents together at the same time. And do you make decisions about jobs together? Do you make decisions about that 10, 10, 10 rule together? Like, how does that relationship flourish over time? Because I think you both have fantastic relationships. Great partners. Thank you. I, yeah, I you know, it's, it, it's a tremendous amount of work. Mm-hmm. It's work. It's helpful that I like him so much. I like him. He's my, he is my best friend. And it always frustrates him when I say that. Like he's like, oh, I don't want to be your best friend. I'm I'm supposed to be your hot, hunky guy. And I'm like, well, you're that too. You're that. I mean, I don't want to like go be with anybody else, but you're the person that I want to be with. You're the person that I want to be sitting on the couch with. You're the person that I want to read my book next to and crawl into bed like weary at the end of the day with. I only want to spend time with you in the world. I don't trust anybody more than I trust him. And it's funny, I was just thinking about, I'm able to do what you said, Cynthia, about like go to work and just be at work because of Steven, because he's got them and they're safe and complete with him. Now, I also know that when he's got them, he's definitely ordering dinner. Like he's not making, <laughs> which is crazy, which he's going to get mad when I say that, because which is nuts because my husband can cook. He is such a good cook, but he is tired. He's working full time, but it's pretty impressive to feel that partnered. I feel like this many years in, because I also know he knows them as well as I do. You know, there's not sort of like, oh, I know them so much better. And he knows them. There's a sort of a complementary awareness of the kids. Like I'm strong with them in ways that maybe he's not. And he's got a little bit of magic with him, them, that I don't. I don't know what that kind of magic sauce is that happens in families, but I'm very grateful for it. That I'm sure that I think that you're both nodding your heads. That maybe happens in your house as well. Yeah. With kids, with your kids. Yeah. It's interesting because... When Kirk and I got married, I was still working on my Broadway show in New York. I had no intention of leaving New York City. We didn't talk about it ahead of time. We didn't talk about, well, what happens if we end up in a Midwestern state with children and I get offered another Broadway show? Then, what? you know, it didn't occur to us to have those conversations before we got married. So in some ways, I think I got very lucky to be blessed with someone who, when we took these big life pivots... He just kind of kept saying yes and like, okay, sure, yeah. And so his jobs too have been a bit extra non-traditional because I think he saw the writing on the wall and was like, oh, (laughs) if I want to continue to be a super present dad and my wife is off doing jobs now and then and in other states and sometimes it's really concentrated hours and sometimes not – maybe maybe I need to also have sort of a freelance career. So that's kind of, he ended up going down a little bit more of a freelance career as well, not in anything to do with the entertainment field, but it's allowed us to have that push and pull that he's really busy sometimes, I'm really busy other times. We've been lucky that we've been able to kind of calibrate. And he just says yes to just about everything. I mean, I think we both just have the mindset of if we want to make it work, let's just say yes, we'll figure it out. Yep. And I think that's the mindset because, you know, going back to that former student I talked about when that person said to her, you can only do one or the other. My response to her at the time was, she's right. Like I said, if that's what you believe, then she's right. And she cried some more. And I'm like, no, but listen to what I'm saying. If you believe you can only do one or the other, you're right. Right. If you believe you can figure it out and make it work and do both, you're right. So you're right. Both are going to be hard. So which hard do you want to choose? 
and we chose you the choose. heart of like figuring out how to quote unquote figuring out how to do it and then you know what <laughs> but you have it all and then you know what you also do you find your community yeah you find the other people who are are choosing the hard choosing this variation of the hard yeah. and you share how are you doing the hard could you help me figure out this piece of the hard <laughs> right. could you take care of my kids while i go over there and figure out that kind of the hard and let me peek over the fence and figure out how you know you're doing it oh you're doing it like that okay like <laughs> yeah. you find your people yeah, and you, you get ideas yeah. from other other women and other and other families and you go oh, okay and you also none of us have done it before we're all figuring this crap out on the fly yeah we're, like we all like let me share my wisdom we're all just figuring it out right and thank yeah. god we're just doing it together. I mean, that's kind of the point that we're yeah. all in it together and we're better together. Yeah. See, we solved all your problems, Chels. Thank you. Everything's You're clear gonna now, be right? Fine. I, feel, I feel great now. I got this. <laughs> you do have it. You know, I'm going to tell you do. something. You absolutely I'm going to tell you something that I absolutely believe and it's going to sound like malarkey, but I, it is 1000% the truth. And Cynthia, back me up. Two is easier than one. Absolutely not. We're in a fight. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to say it again. Two is easier than one. The second is easier than the first because you know what you're doing. Okay. You yes. know what you're doing. I do two think that may be true. And there, and there, and that there's part, a, there yes. is a weird cosmic balance that happens in your house. You're suddenly like where we were three. Now we are four. And I don't know why in my house it was like, our house went king and it was like, now we are a foursome. I don't know. Wow. It made all the sense in the Bunchrock house and we just made sense. I want to back you up on that so much, Aaron Dilly, BFF. Are we and in a fight? We're in a fight. I got to tell you, in a fight. that was not my experience for the first two years or so. Cynthia's been telling oh, me for six shit. months, she's like, two's going to be get rough. Ready. Just get ready. Oh, she's just been prepping me for it. <laughs> Yeah. But, but now I've Feel set that. up such a hard expectation yes. that you're going to have that second one and be like, Cynthia was out of her mind. I this appreciate is so that. easy. Oh, I appreciate that. I've honestly been saying this whole pregnancy, like, is it better or worse that I know how hard it is to have a newborn, that I know how hard it is to have a one-year-old? You know, it's like, I think it does help, though. I think it does help that you know a little bit about what you're getting into. Yeah. And your point about community, about like you find your people who are doing the stuff similar thing and mm -hmm. my group texts with my girlfriends who are moms and it just makes all the difference in the world to it's be everything. in touch with yes people who are on that journey with you and trying to figure it out you're exactly right we don't know no one's ever done this before we're all no. just no. making it up and that's okay no and, and it, that is totally yep. okay and as, as much as it's like you know it's tale as old as time motherhood blah 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 the, the minute you're holding your kid you're like what the hell who how do you what yes. and everyone's always supposed to be oh it's so natural it's and all of it it's <laughs> like you have to learn how to do it mm -hmm. and then it's marvelous and awesome and terrific but you do have to learn how to do it at every oh, stage my. The conversations I am having stage. with my teens right now, goodness oh, gracious. <laughs> oh, you know, me no one prepped me for that. <laughs> I did not get the memo that these are conversations oh. we would be needing to have. So you're learning me all too. the time, right? You're all flying the time. by the and, pants all the time. And as much as you think, and listen, I've told you, my mom and I are still so tight. And I'm like, mom, I'm still calling her. She's 81. And I'm. you think that they're going to be 17 and more autonomous. And the older they get, the more, the more sometimes they need you. Yeah. But it's, it, it continues to be more revealing to me about your own humanity too. You know, like I, Anna got into to Lehigh and she worked so hard. He was so diligent. She was so focused. She was so, and then I like projectile, like tears popping out of my eyeballs. So like my heart left my body. I was so proud. <laughs> and in that moment, it was like my ego, like any sense of what I ever wanted for myself left. 
And I was like, I will drive an Uber. I will sell an organ. I will whittle furniture. I will work at the <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. I will do anything to make this dream happen for you. Because I was so proud. And I was like, oh, that feeling of, like, there wasn't anything left of, like, I might still have to play Medea one time at the New Jersey Shakespeare. I was, it was gone. <laughs> right. It was just like, I've got to get this kid to this school. That's revealing. It's like stuff is revealing itself all of the time. And that's why it continues to be even, even though it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, it's the best thing. I think it's really beautiful to hear both of you talk about how your priorities change over the years and in beautiful ways, like in ways that like Mm -hmm. Cynthia, you're like, I couldn't have expected that becoming a parent was going to just rock my world in this beautiful way. You know, you, you didn't, you didn't anticipate that. And I feel that I feel that way, too. You know, I think like becoming a parent makes you prioritize your time differently, makes you prioritize your energy differently. And I do think in positive ways. I think there's something about like, if you want something to get done, give it to a busy person. Like if you want something to get done, like give it to a mom, like they're going to figure out how to how to make it happen, how to to do it. it. Right. I felt so much of that in the past two years. Like, okay, this is the time I've got. And here's what I'm going to make of it. And and then the other stuff's not as important anymore. And I think that can be really liberating after being really career focused for a time to just feel like, oh, well, I have less time. Therefore, I have a few less things I can choose to do. So they're going to be the really important ones. They're going to be the things I actually care about instead of hustling for every possible opportunity that can kind of disperse your energy in a in a different way. And of course, I think everyone can get there and however they get there in their life. But I think motherhood has been that for me. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what else I would add? And Erin, I think this came from you. I think this came from a Facebook post back in the days when Facebook was cool. Way it back. It still is. Is it? I can't, I, <laughs> I can't you're even over. figure out how to sign on to my Facebook right now. Chelsea can attest. I apparently have two accounts. We can't figure out why. And I can never figure, figure out. out which one I'm on. Anyway, the point is, I think this came from a Facebook post years and years ago that I stole from you. And I have never forgotten it. And it got me over a hump. Aaron Dilly, BFF. It was something to the effect of sometimes what's important is rather than meaning a little bit to a lot of people, you're going to mean a whole lot to just a few. For me, I was really struggling with like, I was conducting on Broadway and now I'm like up night breastfeeding and changing diapers. Like what's happened to my life? And there was something about this idea of Yeah, you were, you know, quote unquote, performing for 2000 people every night who it meant a little bit to them. You were sort of, you know, like it was a little bit meaningful to a lot of people. But now I am 100 percent meaningful to this one person or my husband and child and the next child, like to just this small group of people. I mean, everything. When I'm performing, I mean a little bit to a lot, but here I mean everything to just a few. And like, there was something about that mindset that was really cool to think about and helped me kind of get over this hump of being okay with my world getting smaller at times Mm -hmm. because it got only got smaller and said, well, like in a way it was actually a much bigger, more fulfilling world, but it at times felt smaller. And that was a, do you remember posting that? I think I do. I do. But it's also, I, I remember and I understand that feeling so succinctly because the feeling that you're describing of being, because it's also very, those moments are very isolating. They're very isolating and they're very lonely. It's hard to derive that sort of the majesty and the beauty and the um, ego kind of dies in that. Yeah. One, one thousand percent it does and it dies necessarily so that that baby can survive so that you say okay i don't matter so that you can literally survive (laughs) so that i don't need to get any sleep and i don't need to flourish so that you do i mean it's biological i mean the stuff that we know once we get past that hump is huge in the moment it's kind of scary. And that's where community comes in because you have all the other moms going, yeah, 
I about lost my mind and it's not poetic and it's really difficult and not what they write, you know, odes about or the songs. But 17 years later, they ugly cry about when they're, you know, they get the acceptances from colleges. So (laughs) it must be worth something. (laughs) Erin, any parting words of wisdom? Anything you want to leave with us before Um, we wrap up? You know what? I just will say I that what I've loved about being a mom, it's made me exponentially a, a better human being. And it's made me unquestionably a better artist. And I really, really like my kids. I like them. And it's an interesting, the whole thing is kind of fascinating to me. I will say this about our industry. It's not necessarily kid friendly. I have found that my life has only gotten better being a mom and the, that this business has only become more beloved to me with them in it, for sure. Do you think that this is a kid-friendly business, Cynthia? And it was when I started by a really? little bit. Really? By a little bit, yes. I was going to say ahead. the number of hours I breast pumped, like I remember doing a stretch of the national tour of Wicked and I had to pump in the handicapped bathroom stall. It was all that was available. And flip to come from away, 15 years later, we had some actors, you know, I had my own kids along. I negotiated a few things in my contract that made it just a little bit easier to have my kids along. We had some people who had babies on the tour. There were some things that they were able to negotiate. So I feel like there's been some some accommodations, I think, that are being made so that mothers can do their work and still be moms that feels a little bit different than it did 15 years ago yeah yeah i know all right my loves i've loved every minute i have to go i have to go get my dog <laughs> so really poor wet. dog who's just been <laughs> wet. you have to see him relegated look to the outside look i mean look at him. all look the parents out is. there oh, oh, oh Sammy. Sammy. he's so wet uh, and Aaron, listen, we're including you. we're including the animals as the babies too. I think so. It's if you're a working actor with an animal, care. same. It's it is, just as it is. It's, it's another little living being that you are responsible <laughs> for. <laughs> always, always. Yes. Aaron, thank you so uh, much for being with us today. This was such a great conversation. I appreciate I've loved everything every you minute. and Cynthia shared today. It was awesome. I know. And Chelsea, I'm thinking of you and I'm sending you all the love and I'm Thanks. guaranteeing you. I want you to meditate on what I shared with you. I know that Cynthia had some alternate ideas, but I have a feeling, I have a witchy feeling about I... this baby will be the incredible sleeping baby. Oh, Oh, please manifest that for me, mm-hmm. with me. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. I'll let you know. Let you know when she All comes. Right. Cannot wait. Thanks, Erin. All right, dear ones. All right, my love. And scene. Perfect. And scene. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a screenshot wherever you're listening, share it on Instagram, tag us when you do at BWA Vocal Coach, share this episode with a friend who might enjoy it, and please leave us a review. We love to hear from you about what is resonating as you listen to the podcast. And if you're ready to take your next step, but you aren't entirely sure what that should be, then take our quiz. We'll strategize with you to outline a roadmap to your unique goals. Plus, from there, you can book a free consult and chat with us. Visit bwayvocalcoach.com backslash take quiz. We can't wait to hear your story and help you take the next step in your career.